Our first alternative theory of recovery is promissory estoppel. But before we jump into these elements and really start breaking down examples of promissory estoppel as an alternative theory of recovery, we need to do a quick refresher from an organizational standpoint because principles of promissory estoppel. Remember, promissory estoppel is all about detrimental reliance. And this idea of detrimental reliance, principles of promissory estoppel can creep into our formation discussion, right? And mutual assent. This idea of detrimental reliance, remember in our offer and acceptance analysis was something we already talked about. So we want to be able to separate in our analysis the difference between detrimental reliance as a principle that we discuss in formation of the traditional enforceable contract and promissory estoppel as an alternative theory of recovery available to the plaintiff in the the case that we do not have formation of a traditional enforceable contract. So if you remember, right, we said when we were talking about mutual assent and specifically termination of the offer and irrevocable offers, remember that we said that one of the four major ways that an offer can become irrevocable is if the offeree detrimentally relies on the offer in a reasonable and foreseeable manner. And just to illustrate this, probably the most you know famous case of this and where you really see it tested a lot on contracts fact patterns is this idea of Drennan, right? Drennan v. Star Paving Co. in this context of general contractor and subcontractor relationships. So just bear with me for a second. If you remember this case, it's a very famous contract law case. We have a subcontractor, right? And, and again, this is a very common fact pattern, right? We have a, gen a subcontractor, a general contractor, and some sort of project, right? So there's three parties involved here. We have a party that needs uh, usually a construction project completed. We have a general contractor whose job is to basically manage and oversee the construction project, make sure everything happens smoothly. And we have subcontractors who are going to be different contractors that come along to do specific roles in the project, right? So the way that this works is in this general contractor and subcontractor relationship and how it usually goes is through this two-way bidding process. So what happens if a, and this was the fact pattern in Drennan, right? So we had a school district that needed a school built, right? They have a big school construction project. So they put this out there. They say, hey, look, we need uh, construction of a school, right? So they say, hey, general contractors, come to us with your bid price. We're going to take the lowest bid and let that, you know, obviously they want to pay the least amount of money for the project. So we're going to go with the lowest bidder, right? So all the general contractors come forward that know how to do school construction projects and submit bids to the school district. But they're not just pulling their bid price out of thin air, right? The general contractors are relying on bids from subcontractors. And in this case, we had Star Paving Co. So as one of the things that's going to need to be completed for the school project, there's going to need to be some road work paving. So in their calculation, in their bid, when they submit that to the school, right, they're relying on a bid price from Star Paving Co. Right? Star Paving Co. submits a bid that says, hey, look, we can do the paving part of this project for $7,000. Right? And so the general contractor, Drennan, relies on that $7,000 bid when they submit their full bid price to the school district. Well, of course, in the fact pattern, the school district ends up accepting Drennan's bid. Drennan tells the good news to Star Paving Co. Hey, look, our, our bid was accepted. You're going to get to do the project. And then, of course, the Star Paving Co., the subcontractor, tells Drennan, oh, you know what? We screwed up. We gave you the wrong bid price. We can't do the paving for $7,000. We can only do it for $15,000, right? And then so Drennan has to scramble, find a different subcontractor, right? And the question is whether, and again, this is in our formation of the traditional enforceable contract analysis, whether this subcontractor, Star Paving Co., was free to revoke their offer. And basically what the court says in this very seminal case is that at the moment that Drennan, the general contractor, relies reasonably and foreseeably to their detriment 
on the subcontractor's offer, this offer actually becomes irrevocable. So even though it wasn't an option contract, it wasn't a firm offer under 2205, which up until this case was really required to say an offer was irrevocable, the court here is saying that because the general contractor reasonably and foreseeably relied on this bid to their detriment, that this offer of this bid became irrevocable, right? Now, all of this is a big review, and you might be wondering why I'm going over all of this again, but the point here is to remember that all of this, right, what we're talking about here, falls under our analysis of mutual assent. We're still trying to get at, in this type of analysis, whether a traditional enforceable contract existed, right? Which is very different from moving past that and saying, okay, for whatever reason, we don't have a traditional enforceable contract and we're using promissory estoppel as an alternative theory of recovery. So if you're looking at a fact pattern, right, and you see something more like Drennan, where we have an offer open and somebody's relying on that offer to their detriment, that's going to fall under your mutual assent analysis, right? If it looks more like Drennan, especially if you see a general contractor, subcontractor fact pattern, which is commonly tested, you know that that's generally going to be under mutual assent. And the question is whether the offer is irrevocable, right? Now, where you can usually distinguish this is if the problem isn't with mutual assent, right? We have a contract or an offer or a promise that lacks consideration, right? That's usually where we're going to see, just gonna erase this real quick. That's usually where we're going to see promissory estoppel as an actual alternative theory to recovery tested, right? Where you're going to go through these three elements and really think about promissory estoppel as an alternative theory is when we have a promise that lacks consideration, which is usually going to look like a gift promise. So keep in mind the Drennan case and an offer that's open where we're saying, okay, detrimental reliance offer becomes irrevocable, where a promissory estoppel principle of detrimental reliance is being used in our mutual assent analysis. And let's compare that to an analysis of an alternative theory of recovery under section 90 of the second restatement promissory estoppel, right? So the fact pattern here, where we're really thinking about promissory estoppel as an alternative theory to recovery, is where somebody relies to their detriment on a gift promise, right? So the classic example here would be, and I guess we can go through the elements real quickly, and by the way, this is coming from section 90 of the second restatement of contracts, which most courts are going to follow. If you look around on promissory estoppel, you'll see a hundred different definitions. Sometimes you'll see it listed as five elements, four elements, three elements, but at its core, these are the three core elements, right? And it comes from the second restatement, section 90 of contracts, which is what most law schools are going to follow, which is what you're going to want to use on the bar exam, right? And this is what most courts follow, right? These are the three key elements, okay? So what we say here is that a promise, even if it lacks consideration, right, is binding and enforceable if the promisor should reasonably expect the promise to induce action or forbearance from the promisee. Number two, the promise does induce such action or forbearance, and injustice can be avoided only by enforcement of the promise. So this first element, we're talking mostly about foreseeability. The second element, we're talking about this idea of detrimental reliance. And this third element, remember we said the theme with all of our alternative theories is this idea of equity or justice, right? You know, did this promisee actually incur some sort of loss in reliance on the promise? Okay, so let's just look at some examples really quick. And again, the, the key fact pattern here, if you're thinking about promissory estoppel as an alternative theory is you're usually looking at a promise that lacks consideration, usually a gift promise, right? I offer to give you this dry erase marker for free, and then you rely on that promise. So let's run with that example, right? So, and, and an example like that, where I'm offering to give you a dry erase marker for free, should I, the promisor, reasonably expect that that promise is going to induce you to take any action or forbearance. I say, I will give you this dry erase marker for free. You say, I accept. 
Should I reasonably expect that that's going to induce action or forbearance? Well, maybe some, right? Maybe I could expect that you're now going to go to the bank and withdraw $5, right? That might be an action I could expect you to take. But would I expect you, if I offered to give you this dry erase marker for free, that you would go buy a $1,000 whiteboard, right? Let's say that I offer to give you this dry erase marker for free. You say, oh, that's great. I know I'm going to get this free dry erase marker. I know I'm going to go buy a state-of-the-art brand new $1,000 whiteboard in reliance on this offer of the dry erase marker, right? Would that be something that me as a promisor should reasonably have expected you to do? My offer of a dry erase marker that's worth probably $5, right? My promise to give you this for free. Could I reasonably expect that that was going to induce you to go buy a $1,000 dry erase board? Probably not, right? That's not very foreseeable, right? This first element is all about foreseeability. And that's just not a very foreseeable action or forbearance that you might take based on my promise of a free dry erase mark. Thank you so much for watching this video preview of our Legal Education Accelerator Program or LEAP for short. If you would like to see the conclusion of this video and gain full access to our entire 1L and 2L video library, integrated outlines, streamable audio versions, additional practice exams with explanations, and much more, we invite you to head over to our website and join the thousands of law students who have already enrolled. To get started with your no-risk free trial today, simply click the link in the description box below or visit www.studicata.com forward slash leap. Hi everyone, my name is Serena and I'm currently a law student at South Texas College of Law, Houston. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Shiva and I'm currently a law student at Southwestern. Hi everyone, my name is Michelle um, and I am a first year student at South Texas College of Law, Houston. Um, I used the Studicata study video series last semester to help me prepare mostly for contracts um, and I actually made an A plus in contracts last semester which I greatly dedicate to the Studicata video. By using Studicata to help me prepare for my final exam, I was able to score the highest grade out of my class on the final and even have my uh, essay distributed as the model answer. Not to mention I had done quite poorly on the midterm and was struggling throughout the whole course of the semester, understanding the material and keeping up with lectures. Because of the Studicata video lectures, I was able to go into my exams with a feeling of confidence. I didn't have to worry about what the rules of law were or how I was going to organize my answer to an essay question. I would absolutely recommend the Studicata series and their online course materials to anyone. Um, I think that they are not like um, professor lectures that you might find online or other outside study materials that you may encounter. Um, I think that the Studicata videos really focus on not only ensuring that you understand the material that you're going to encounter on your final, um, but they also help you to understand kind of the best method for test taking and they really break down how to approach each problem and the best ways to tackle certain methods on testing um, and I think that's really important and I think it's really special. I don't see that anywhere else um, in any of the other online resources that I've found. So I would certainly recommend Sudakata to anyone who is studying in law school right now. Um, good luck on your studying and you're going to do great. I would definitely uh, recommend Studicata to anybody watching this video. Uh, give it a chance. I'm sure, I'm positive that you will love it, uh, that you will get a lot out of it, uh, and that you will be happy that you gave it a chance. Uh, I definitely am. I know I will be using uh, Studicata in the future. And I cannot thank Studicata enough for getting me through my first semester of law school. I will definitely, definitely continue to watch the Studicata video lectures throughout my law school career. And I highly recommend that any future or current law student do the same.